The Cuyahoga County Committee of the Whole, continuation of budget hearings. Committee meeting for Monday, October 30th, 2017, is called to order, and the clerk will please call the roll. Calling the roll, Mr. Schron? Here. Ms. Conwell? Present. Mr. Jones? Here. Ms. Brown? Here. Mr. Harrison? Here. Ms. Simon? Ms. Simon is absent at the moment. Ms. Baker? Mr. Miller? Here. Mr. Tuma? Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. And Council President Brady? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Before we start, I just want to make everyone aware we have a very distinguished person in our audience today, our former first council president, Ms. C. Ellen Connolly. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we're going to we're going to get into uh, uh, public comment related to the agenda, and and before we start, I'm going to say that I understand that we have uh, some very distinguished people who have come to uh, testify on on the issues relating to uh, to housing and demolition, and I'm I'm really grateful for your presence. And uh, and in recognition of that, if there's no objection, I'm going to make a couple of slight modifications to the procedure. And and one of them is that we're going to going to relax the three minutes a little bit. And and if someone goes over a minute or two, we're willing to bend a little bit on that. We have a lot to do, so I had asked. Not very much, but we're going to bend it a little bit. And the second thing is that when we get into the hearing and after the uh, Department of Development uh, uh, makes its presentation, normally when we do public comment, it's just comment received and there's no interaction. But in, in this case, we're going to consider the... Uh, the testifiers as expert witnesses, and and uh, and when we get to the questions for the director, if anyone also has questions for any of the people who uh, who gave testimony, if they're able to stay, I'm going to allow that to take place as well. So, with that, I I would ask uh, the clerk for the name of the first person who is scheduled to uh, speak on public comment. Uh, the first person I have is Mayor Wheelow. OK. Mayor Wheelow, can, welcome to the committee. Thank you for joining us. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, President Brady, our county council. Housing represents 66% of our real estate value in the county. If the housing stock is in decline, the region cannot fully recover its vibrancy. We have one of the highest percentages of underwater mortgages in the country. The housing stock cannot regain value if blighted homes remain unaddressed here in Kaiga County. Residents are unlikely to invest in their homes if they believe that their neighborhood is deteriorating, and the county has suffered out migration for decades, and it continues today because, as you know, since 2010, Cuyahoga County has lost another 19,764 people. Being largely built out, limits our opportunities for new construction, and we know that we will be the first built out county in Ohio. Demolition provides the opportunity to build new housing, which is highly uh, desirable and sought after, and not just in the inner rings, but also in our outer rings, where we have seen commercial values go up, such as in Rocky River, where you use the dollars for commercial project there, an exciting project in the inner ring suburb in Shaker Heights. There's over $230 million in delinquent residential property taxes, representing over 36,000 delinquent structures. This is the next storm. 
First, I came here in 2005 to tell you that we had a foreclosure crisis. Now you're going to have a tax delinquent crisis, and this will only likely lead to more problems. I wanted to ask you to please, the hardest hit funds are, the, are only able to be used for demolition if a property is owned by the county land bank in Cuyahoga County, and this is unlikely to occur in the entering suburbs. That is why we really need this money, and that's why we really need uh, for some changes to happen. You know, blighted structures are the cancer of a neighborhood, and unless all the cancers are removed, the blight will spread, destroying what we've already done. Let's not make the same mistakes we constantly make in Cuyahoga County. You see a little bit of a spike of goodness, and then we stop. It happened to us before and don't let us happen again. I wanted to read to you a letter from the Cuyahoga County Mayors and Cities Managers Association. Dear members of the Cuyahoga County Council, the Cuyahoga County Mayors and City Managers Association is urging you to keep the funding of the County Demolition Fund and not divert 17 million of the remaining commitment to the general fund as that it will stop all programs that are being made to stabilize the housing stock in the county. As you are aware, there's an ongoing long-term need for this type of public funds. This fund is the only source of public funds that can be used for residential and commercial demolition. These funds have allowed built-out suburbs opportunity for new infill construction and commercial redevelopment, which builds the tax base and provides desirable housing and retail alternatives to attract and retain residents. Although our funds are available for City of Cleveland demolitions, many of these funds have geographic limitations or other restrictions that would make them less effective at addressing blight throughout the city. This diversion of funds will likely result in at least 1,400 structures requiring demolition to remain standing, further dragging down values. Again, we urge you to please keep the demolition fund intact to continue the progress that is being made in our wonderful county. On behalf of the entire association, Michael S. Prochuk, President Mayor of the Village of Brooklyn Heights. I'm gonna leave that with your clerk and the letter that I had sent you personally about the city of South Yukon and all the wonderful things and the opportunity we have, we have had. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Gene. Frank Ford. Chairman Miller, President Brady, and members of council, thanks for the opportunity to talk about the uh, reduction in demolition fund. Um, I also I want to say quickly that I liked everything that Mayor Wheelow said in terms of what is the importance of this? How does it impact people's lives and their, their home values? Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to limit my remarks to uh, the what seems to be the basis that was relied upon in removing the 17 million, and it's, it really comes down to two things. The county uh, staff made an estimate of need in, in demolition, and that seems to be an error I'm gonna talk about in a minute, and they estimated the funding capacity separate from the 17 million, so that it would imply that there wouldn't need to be the 17 million, and there's errors in that calculation as well. I have a five-page handout, which hopefully you all have, which goes in a lot more detail. I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to summarize the high points. First of all, the estimate of need cited a need in Cleveland of only 4,000. That is nearly 1,000 too low. Uh, there was a committee of people met last week, about a half dozen from City of Cleveland, County Land Bank, Case Western Reserve University, and Western Reserve Land Conservancy, and we reviewed all this data and uh, came up with revisions. So that is... Uh, a thousand too low. The estimate of need in East Cleveland failed to take into consideration the 156 apartment buildings, which you can't budget those the same as you would a house. Those 156 apartment buildings are the equivalent of another thousand homes because it's about $13 million for those apartment buildings. On the funding side, the capacity side, the estimate relied upon 1,400 project projected demolitions by the county land bank in 2019 and 2020. The land bank is confirmed, and hopefully there's somebody here from the land bank to, to confirm for you, those 1,400 are not gonna be available. The estimate also relied upon 1,200 land bank demolitions this year, and the land bank is confirmed there's only 200 of those left because 1,000 have already been done. So you can't really use the 1,200 
and look forward to what is remaining to be done. So there's an error there as well. And finally, the estimate relied upon 1,000 demolitions projected by the city of Cleveland for the Safe Routes to School program. Similarly, 150 of those have already been done, leaving only 850 to be part of the calculation. So overall, the need, which was projected for the county to be 5,500 demolitions, is more like 6,700 demolitions. And on the capacity side, the, the capacity was projected to be able to do 6,800 demolitions separate from this 17 million. That's actually only 4,300. So what it comes down to is that you've got a shortfall uh, when you compare the need and the surplus of 2,400 demolitions. Uh, the estimate also erred in one other way that I want to point out. The estimate did project future capacity for funding in 2019 and 2020, but it didn't do the other comparison for future need. And when this group that I mentioned met and we went through a lot of calculations, we came up with another, um, another 2,700 demolitions that, that are likely to occur in the next several years. So you can't look at this as a static problem like, well, the number is what it is now and there won't be any more. You have to consider the number of homes that are not yet condemned in the city of Cleveland, but might be boarded up. Um, now, lastly, I want to say that the 50 million, I don't know that anybody would disagree that the 50 million was intended to address blight that's undermining the housing market. Where is that problem occurring? It's 80% in Cleveland and has been 80% in Cleveland. I haven't seen anybody dispute that. And about 20% in the suburbs, 10% in East Cleveland, 10% in the balance of the suburbs. That concern over that imbalance led this council, I believe, and the administration to say, you know what, let's put some restrictions on Cleveland. We don't want Cleveland to just suck up all the money. So let's make sure that the suburbs get their fair share. And that was a reasonable thing to do. Unfortunately, what's turned out now that it's three years later, the suburbs didn't get their 20 percent. The suburbs got 60 percent of the demolition funding. And I'm, I'm sure you put it to good use. Everybody did. But Cleveland only got 40% of the money, and it has 80% of the problem. This is really not the time to be cutting back on the funding just when Cleveland needs an opportunity to try to catch up. So two recommendations. One, restore the full $17 million to the fund. And second, remove the restrictions on Cleveland so that Cleveland can begin to catch up on the need for its demolition. I do want to point out that I'm not suggesting that going forward, no money be available to the suburbs. I think money should still be available to the suburbs based on their proportionate need. And I'm going to stop there, which I know I went over my three minutes. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay. Ayanna Blue Donald. This is as good as I could get it. Good afternoon. Chairman Miller, Council President Brady, and members of Cuyahoga Council, thank you for having me here today. Building and housing is grateful. We have been awarded um, through the city of Cleveland around $8.9 million since the inception of the Cuyahoga County Demolition Fund, which has approximately um, been able to fund about 840 structures. We've leveraged this fund along with other sources, um, most recently the $13 million um, of the general fund money for demolition and to help our demolition strategy. Keep in mind from the very beginning, the city of Cleveland has worked hand in hand with county staff. We help implement procedures, reimbursement processes, just how this exactly would work to coordinate a smooth process for the implementation of the program. Um, in the very beginning, it was mentioned that it was important that the suburbs were able to get their allotment of their fair share of the Cuyahoga County Demolition Fund and make sure that we wait our turn. Um, we did the rounds as we were requested to um, apply for the rounds. And in the end, we would have our opportunity to kind of catch up and do and perform our demolitions for the city. We've always had a capacity and inventory to perform the demolitions if the funds are available and provided. We currently have 941 properties that are approved for demo, meaning condemned, inspected, and approved and ready to go, and an another 946 that are kind of in the pipeline and underneath legal review. I have included also a summary of the demolitions that we've done by ward um, since Mayor Jackson took office in 2006 when we really started to ramp up our demolitions, which is a little over 9,200 structures. 
I've also included a summary of the awards because there's been just some conversation about um, rehab and where our demolition work actually occurs for us. But keep in mind that there's only been 46 rehabs of condemned structures in the city of Cleveland this year. That does not put a dent in the properties that we have to address the vacant abandoned nuisance properties in the city. And if you take a look at the wards that are really are focused on for our demolition strategies, they're not typically the wards that you would think of hot spots for rehabilitation and growth that's occurring. Generally, those areas are not the areas that we're doing demolitions in because those markets tend to take care of themselves. Additionally, there's been some questioning and just want to clarify our, the funding process or the timing as far as the city of Cleveland applying for different rounds. Certain rounds have taken a very long time. It's not as if the city of Cleveland, we have the capacity, we have the expertise to move fast. Some of the rounds have taken five, six months to get from submission process all the way through signature process as far as county executive signing and us being able to move on those. With a faster round and faster submission process, or even a, a change, um, I guess, cap, as far as the rounds, we would be able to address more properties. As Frank previously mentioned, the city of Cleveland's demolition need is great and substantial. Right now, we have a current need of around 5,000 parcels. That includes what I previously mentioned, those approved for demo, those that are in the pipeline, properties that are condemned, and properties that still need to be looked at as far as complaints that are in our vacant property unit. And also a projected, um, projected another 2,000 parcels. If you look at the past three years, our funding that we've had, generally all of our funding, majority of our funding has come through this, the Cuyahoga County demolition funding. So we're very grateful. However, for it to completely stop would be detrimental to the work that we're doing in the city. Our overall demolition strategy is to prioritize our demolitions based on a couple of factors. This includes safety issues, police calls, um, amount of time that a property has been vacant, how many times a property has boarded up, clustering of other demolitions to um, try to fund economic growth in areas that maybe some infill development can happen. The volume and clustering of vacant properties discourages private investment. No one's going to come on a block with, you know, 10 vacant properties and invest in that one to fix it up. It's that cancer that really needs to be eradicated. With the help of the city's additional demolition funds, we thought we were staying the course and we were on a good way and good track to address the significant amount of impact in the areas and stabilize our neighborhoods. If the Cuyahoga County Demolition Fund is removed, we have no projected demolition funds moving forward after this year. Zero. The amount of vacant, abandoned, and nuisance properties is not static and is not at a maintenance level currently. It is not at a level that we can maintain those 2,000 properties that are projected to come on board the next two years will absolutely be vacant abandoned properties that need to be raised. The city of Cleveland will not be able to administer anything without the demolition fund. And I don't want to make it just seem dire, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak, but we absolutely still need your help with the Cuyahoga County Demolition Fund. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Jean. Melran Leach. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, um, Chairman Miller and Council President Brady and members of council. My name is Melrin Leach. Uh, Mayor King would want to be here today, but he couldn't because he has to take care of something with the ARCO site, which is another major problem for the city of East Cleveland. Um, I would like to make sure we talk about the benefit of the county demo fund and what it has done for us so far. We have been able to clear the western portion of the city, which is paving the way for a major development to come. We've signed an MOU with the Cuyahoga County Land Bank that they will come in and they'll be the major developer for that land. Without the county demo fund, there would have been no way that this could have happened. Um, secondly, under the second round that we applied for that we're able to get the funds, it is paving the way to make sure that residents are able to maintain their insurance. I get at least two to three phone calls from residents that need letters from me stating that they need to keep their insurance. And for us to make sure that we clear the vacant, blighted, and dilapidated properties that surround them has been a major benefit. 
I couldn't imagine sometime living in the areas that they have to live in. So right now in the heart of East Cleveland, we ha we're making a difference. Right now we have about 200 slated for that general area alone. That will make and pave the way for the residents to take care of the um, neighbor next door. And we can honestly get them to come in to say they want the property next to them. For me, the county demo fund, if it left, would leave us doing about 20 demos a year. We get a little under a million dollars a year from CDBG. In the allocation of how we do our budget, we only allow in the public facilities area about 20 demos. 20 demos would not even make an impact in what we have. In doing the numbers, I have to walk up and down the streets myself to make sure that we put them on the list. Um, we're short staffed. So we're not able to turn around the timetable like the city of Cleveland may have by having a larger staff to get it out. Because like for I said, for, for example, me, myself, being the director, I don't have the liberty to sit back and tell staff to go out and do it. I go out and do it myself. So every single parcel, every house that gets demolished, I make sure I visibly go out and take the pictures and write them up myself. So having an extended time will greatly benefit us. We've streamlined our process. As I'm speaking to you right now, the county land bank is in a meeting with our staff right now because we're shortening our process up. Instead of us doing a, a regular abatement, we're doing a summary abatement that we can speed up the process to make it faster. So I would greatly appreciate if you guys would seriously, rec seriously consider keeping the county demo fund in place so we can catch up and make sure that we're not the weakest link in the city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jean. Mark McDermott. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm testing, testifying today on behalf of Enterprise Community Partners, a housing and community development national nonprofit. We have offices across the country, including here in Cleveland, where we've been for nearly 30 years, where we work very closely with partners to help the 96,000 Cuyahoga County residents who are grappling with housing insecurity or homelessness. First, I'd like to thank Council for your focused attention on the growing and urgent housing needs in our communities. The future of Cuyahoga County is inextricably linked to the stability of its housing. The county weathered a housing crisis and for decades prior to that, a steady loss in population. And although we are seeing some signs of recovery, creating permanent and equitable stability demands an aggressive and diverse approach. With this in mind, Enterprise has, with other partners, been part of the County Housing Stakeholder Group for over two years. And the County Housing Stakeholder Group represents a wide variety of interests, but has worked collaboratively to identify shared priorities. We supported the Department of Development in developing the first ever County Housing Plan, and we appreciate the opportunity when we presented it to County Council on October 2nd. The County Housing Plan comprehensively identifies the housing issues in our county, as well as strategies and resources necessary to address those issues. One of those is that it's time to implement the County Housing Plan, including a proposed County Housing Fund, part of the right solution. Local housing funds are smart and proven national best practices. There's one in Franklin County, City of Columbus, one in Toledo and Lucas County, one in the city of Cincinnati. And in fact, uh, there's more than 770 local housing funds in 49 states. The proposed county housing fund, while not with a dedicated source of revenue, is still surely a step in the right direction. A well-researched and flexible county housing fund like the one proposed could help seniors age in place, repair homes of low-income families, provide stability for the disabled, for veterans, for youth aging out of foster care, and even protect our critical existing programs against future potential federal or state cuts. With a relatively modest investment, a county housing fund could also leverage other funding from private and philanthropic sources here locally. 
Plus, the recently published Partner Health and Human Services Strategic Plan underscored a safe and stable affordable housing as a top priority to Cuyahoga County residents and the department. We know that investment in housing saves us dollars elsewhere. Whether it be in healthcare or education or workforce development, when you invest in programs like a county housing fund, you are also ensuring that these other county housing investments pay off. The time is now to create a county housing fund in Cuyahoga County. We need a diversity of tools in our toolbox to help low-income families, seniors, and homeless succeed. And we'd be happy to answer any questions or meet with council members to discuss in more detail. And of course, we stand ready to assist the county in implementing a successful county housing fund. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jean. Alan Butler. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chairman Miller, President Brady, and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, as a pro housing programs director for the City of Cleveland Heights, I would like to urge County Council to continue to support and fund the County Demo Fund in order to continue the great progress and efforts made to eliminate blighted and abandoned homes and structures in our community, which help to stabilize neighborhoods and promote economic growth in our city. Termination of this fund prematurely would be detrimental to the growth of Cuyahoga County and the property values for its residents. The City of Cleveland Heights has benefited greatly from the creation of the Demo Bond Fund and has currently removed 39 blighted structures with more pending. The Housing Programs Department has continued to promote the renovation of structures and, had used, and has used demolition as a last resort, which has led to a decrease in the demolitions overall. However, the problem of vacant and abandoned structures continues to be a major threat to the safety and economic stability of our community, and the need for demolition funding as a last resort is still crucial. The future estimates on demolition needs are 10 to 20 homes per year for the next five years for Cleveland Heights alone. Cleveland Heights currently has 556 registered vacant residential structures and 109 bank-controlled structures along with delinquent tax total on the residential properties of over $15 million. Average median home sale prices in Cleveland Heights have increased 8% over the last year. However, some, have shown slow, some areas have shown slower growth than others due to vacant and abandoned structures. Cleveland Heights has encouraged growth and renovation in the city with programs like our down payment assistance program, rehab loans, Senior Paint Program, Senior Violation Repair Program, Lead Safe Cuyahoga Program, Healthy Home Program, and the Side Lock Program, along with the Comprehensive Housing Inspection Department and a proposed citywide CRA for new home construction and renovation. I urge you, on behalf of the City of Cleveland Heights, to complete the original commitment of $50 million to the Demo Bond Fund in order <clears throat> in order to the encur to encouraging signs of housing recovery from the Great Repression, Recession. Excuse me. The city is extremely grateful for the partnership which the county in our re revitalization and continuation of this program is an essential tool in the resurgence of our community and in the stability, safety, and growth of our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I note that uh, Ms. Simon and, uh, and Ms. Baker are now here, have been here for some time, and Ms. Jean. The next speaker is John Amalifo. Chairman Miller, members of Cuyahoga County Council, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Janan Olifo, Executive Director of Famicos Foundation, Cleveland's oldest community development corporation located at 1325 Ansu Road in Cleveland. Famicos was founded in 1969 by a Roman Catholic nun, Sister Henrietta Garris, who came to Huff after the Huff riots to provide the riot weary residents food, clothing, and shelter. The name Famico derived from family cooperatives of families coming together to assist Sister Henrietta in rehabilitating homes 
given to residents at nominal prices <coughs> or for free. Over the years, Famicos grew from a project-based CDC using volunteer labor to accomplish its mission to a place-based CDC responsible for the overall revitalization of the Glenville neighborhood. Our mission is to improve the quality of lives in Greater Cleveland through neighborhood revitalization, affordable housing, and integrated social services. Famicos Foundation has been and is still at the forefront of innovative housing solutions in Cuyahoga County, including the founding of Detroit Showway Housing Corporation and the Cleveland Housing Network in 1981. Our charter allows us to serve other counties such as Jogger, Lake, and Medina counties. We are also a chartered member of NeverWorks America, a 2,400 member organization across the U.S., which is a line item on the federal budget. Today, we own and manage more than 1,000 units of housing, so we know and understand the need for housing in Cuyahoga County. I stand before you to ask for your support of the proposed Cuyahoga County Housing Fund. The proposed county fund was developed following years of deliberations by a county housing stakeholder group comprised of individuals with experience on the topic. The plan, while it may not be perfect, is the first ever of its kind for Cuyahoga County. The plan as proposed is flexible and can be used to support different housing solutions, such as housing for the elderly to age in place, repair homes for low-income families, housing for youth, aging out of foster homes, or to abate homelessness in the county. The revitalization of Cuyahoga County must be a balanced approach, not a single solution. I urge you to support this plan as an investment in the lives of those in need in Cuyahoga County. As, as we all know, housing is where it all begins. If you don't have a place you call home, everything else is secondary. Thank you for this opportunity to speak at your meeting. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Ms. Jean. Martine DeVito. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marty DeVito. I work for Mayor Fletcher Berger in beautiful Bedford Heights. Um, the reason why I'm here is I want to one, say thank you. Without this demolition program, we would still have that ugly eyesore called the Ramada Inn on I-271 North at 24801 Rockside Road. And I want to point out, I agree with all the housing comments that are made, but more importantly, this is an economic development tool that we can't access funds anywhere else. And it, it can, however, leverage funds. So for example, the demolition of the hotel, we were lucky enough, thank you, Councilwoman Brown and the staff, um, we were able to receive funding for the demolition of the hotel at 200,000, but the estimated cost of that was a million. That $200,000 helped leverage $615,000 from the state. It will enable the county to retain a, a corporate headquarters by the name of Universal Windows. There are 40 jobs there with an approximate $3.5 million payroll. With the new land available in inner ring community, they're able to grow to an approximately $6 million payroll. That's huge and is cited not only for infrastructure or in terms of infill development for residential units, you're looking at the ability to redevelop raw land for companies to grow and keep here. They want to be near that infrastructure. They want to be near those intelligent employees. But there's not a pot of money that a small community like ours can access to demo those old antiquity, just old buildings, commercial buildings. So I, I'm empathetic to the strains on your budget, but I would respectfully request that you somehow divert a couple of million, preferably more than a few million, to the Brownfield program to help leverage other funds that can be accessed to demolish these contaminated, 
or just gray field sites and make them available for future expansion for our existing businesses. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Jean? Mr. Joel Ratner? On Mr. Ratner's behalf, this is uh, Justin Fleming. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Miller, President Brady, and members of council. Today I'm here testifying on behalf of Cleveland Neighborhood Progress. We are the nonprofit community development intermediary established in 1989. I have the great pleasure of working with our CDC infrastructure in Cleveland and public-private stakeholders throughout the city and county. In our field, uh, residents and visitors of the city of Cleveland can recognize and are excited about some of the recent investments we've seen in real estate in Cleveland recently, and rightfully so. Those investments ought to be acknowledged and celebrated as they come off the backs of decades of disinvestment and outmigration in the city. What we should ask ourselves now is to think critically about how we can leverage those investments and how we can develop the tools uh, to efficiently and equitably um, support those investments and make sure that the county continues to grow. To that end, we fully support the development of a county housing fund. The great work that's been led by Mr. Surratt and the housing committee clearly identifies the need for a housing fund and has thoughtfully thought about the county's best position in that fund and how, uh, what role it ought to play and what role the various stakeholders around the county can play. However, we believe that it's dangerously short-sighted to think that the stabilization and demolition work in this county is done. As Mr. Ford and Director Donald identified, there are uh, uh, demonstrably more demolitions than we currently have uh, funding to support. Taking or weakening that critical resource uh, has the possibility of undermining the growth that we're currently seeing in the city or keeping it to the few markets that we're currently seeing it in. Cleveland remains one of the poorest cities in the country, 34, 36% poverty rate, I can't remember exactly. That poverty is physically manifest in some of our housing stock today. And with studies show that markets cannot uh, improve or grow unless blight is meaningfully eliminated or mitigated. To that end, I encourage this county to consider a both and approach. Fund the county housing fund. Those needs are very real and there's been a lot of great work as to where the best uh, players' roles and needs are across the county. It is a very, very real need. But you can't build a house with just a hammer and you can't build a house with just a saw. You need the right tools. You need all the tools. To that end, we encourage you to keep the commitment uh, for full 50 million towards demolition. Uh, undermining that great work uh, has, the potential, has the potential, undermining that resource has the potential to undermine that great work that we've seen through the uh, community development uh, infrastructure in the county in the past uh, decades, but particularly in the five, last five years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Jean. Michael Pyrus. Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon. I am testifying on behalf of Neighborhood Housing Services of Greater Cleveland, better known as NHS of Greater Cleveland. Uh, we are a HUD approved counseling agency um, and a nonprofit located in Slavic Village. We have been providing programs and services to support affordable housing for more than 42 years. Uh, we also administer the county's down payment assistance program. Since 2009, we provided over $2.6 million in assistance and leveraging over $18 million of an investment. Uh, in uh, Cuyahoga County. Mm -hmm. I am here in support of the county's housing fund. Uh, as some of my colleagues, Mr. McDermott, as well as John and Alifo mentioned, uh, we too have participated in the county's uh, housing stakeholder group over the last two years. We are excited that this plan uh, will address the county's economic and community stabilization efforts. And we think the housing uh, fund is just a key component of that. Uh, it is instrumental uh, when we talk about uh, community revitalization uh, that the county plan, community and economic development go hand in hand with each other. Um, <clears throat> there are over, uh, there's been a lot of talk about demolition uh, in terms of the number of uh, units that, that need to be demoed. There are over, however, there are over 600,000 occupied units in Cuyahoga County. Uh, the American Community Family Survey estimates that countywide, 13.5% are vacant, meaning that there's more than 85% of units that are occupied, 60% of which are owner-occupied. 
um, of these units, 30% were built in 1940, meaning that the owners often face maintenance and deferred maintenance issues. In the absence of federal dollars, reappropriating all money to demolition would leave no county program to address these units. Uh, this would include the down payment assistance and home repair fund, uh, uh, programs, essential operations for home improvement. If these issues are not addressed due to lack of funds, properties may uh, become attainable, increasing vacancy issues. Uh, we support an emergency fund for demolition, although we think the money is well spent with the county housing fund. Um, again, like our colleagues uh, that spoke on behalf of us before, uh, we think that it is now the time to create a housing fund. Um, we think that a diversity of tools is needed in this county and not just a, a, a single uh, fund to demolition. And so again, I urge you guys to consider the need for a diverse uh, county plan a budget that would include a housing, uh, housing fund. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mayor Annette Blackwell. Good morning, <clears throat> and thank you for having me. Good morning. Good I'm here afternoon. to speak to, oh, it's afternoon, I missed mm -hmm. the morning. I'm here to speak to the county's decision um, regarding the change to, or the removal of a demolition fund. I will not be redundant in the statistics. There's just been so many shared here this morning. I simply would speak on behalf of Maple Heights. I am the mayor of Maple Heights, who is a city right now that has a fiscal emergency designation. Um, and there's a great deal of poverty in the city of Maple Heights. Demolition, I believe, is just one of the strategies to address the fiscal status in the city of Maple Heights. Uh, I agree with Mario DeVito, it's been an economic development tool as we've moved through fiscal emergency and hope to be out of fiscal emergency two years ahead of schedule. But it's also um, a, a quality of life matter. In terms of education, the school's report card, safety, where there is blight and vacancy, there has been reports to show that there's a great deal of, of, of crime and violence, which we've seen in Maple Heights, and the fact that we have almost 10,000 calls to our police. We have diminishing police force. We need 36 officers. We only have 27. And the crimes are becoming more and more violent, those of a sexual nature, armed and aggravated robbery, and a great deal of um, physical assault. For the chief executive officer of the city, this has been a tool, one of the things in my toolkit, and we've heard that term a couple times with those that came here with, prepare it with statistics and a great deal of data for you. But in the seat, in the real world, it is, it is a, something that I go to often in that toolkit to address. Now, we've been very successful prior to me coming to office, and since I've been in office, we, we have received that money, and I've heard from those that it's been a disproportionate share. But I think when people talk about Cleveland and suburbs, a great deal of our residents are Clevelanders, as I am myself coming from the Glenville area. We're delinquent $10 million in property tax collections. We were the hardest hit, one of the hardest hit, in addition to Cleveland and some of the other entering suburbs in the housing market. 2012, the reevaluation, most homeowners saw a 36, 35% decline in valuation. And then 2015, the triennial update, they saw another double digit drop the tune of about 18 in uh, devaluation in the property. And for most of the, the demographics in Maple Heights, this is their biggest asset. This is how they pass on generational wealth. Without the ability to address this issue through everything that's available to us, the grants that we've been very successful in receiving from the county, the partnership with the county, which has been many, and all of the outreach, outreach which I'm very, very grateful for, we would not be moving in a way nor could I assure the residents of the city of Maple Heights. They were on our way to a, a successful revitalization, one that's progressive, and one that I hope will stabilize our neighborhoods. Because the testimonies have been lengthy, and I know you have a full agenda, there's nothing I can say that hasn't been said already. But as the officer of the city, I can tell you that I hope that there is some, there is a two, two-fold approach and that we will not lose all of the assistance in way of the grants that we've been recipients of as well and as well as these funds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jean. Mr. Ed Mayer. Dr. Miller, uh, President Brady, the re remaining members of the council. I come here to speak not really representing any specific organization. 
I come here as a citizen of this community. Now, I've had the opportunity to live in this uh, fine county for more than 40 years. I came here from Ashtabula, Ohio. Ashtabula, Ohio is now the belt buckle on the Rust Belt. It's a very, very decrepit city. In fact, I just had the chance to go back this week, and I found out that they just tore down the house across the street from where I lived. And it's very likely that my house is next. But the point being, at least they're taking out some abandoned, decrepit facilities, houses, and other, other types of facilities, and giving the chance for the community to come back. Here, I live in Lakewood. I have worked very closely with One South Euclid, which is the community development organization in South Euclid. I have you know, the opportunity to see a lot of different areas because I'm, I'm commuting across town. I've also worked with Habitat for Humanity as a volunteer. What can I say? I like to pound nails and paint walls. But even with Habitat for Humanity, in many neighborhoods throughout the city, you can see where the incremental progress that they're making house by house to rehabilitate these facilities is being hampered by the fact that there are so many abandoned buildings still remaining in the neighborhood. In my particular neighborhood, I live on Giel Avenue in Lakewood, over the past year, um, there have been private developers that have come in and rehabilitated about six out of 40 houses on my neighborhood. That's great. When I go out to the community and I go to Buckeye and I go to these other areas that I've been in as a Habitat volunteer, there aren't any private developers coming in to rehab those neighborhoods. We need these funds to take out these abandoned houses, these abandoned buildings, to make these neighbor give these neighborhoods a chance to come back, a chance for some progress. You have, you know, how many people you have here today that are struggling and volunteering and putting together all kinds of organizations to fight this problem? They need your support. As a citizen, I think it's my tax money well spent, and I encourage you to re restore this funding so that this community can continue to go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Jean. Councilman Tony Brancatelli. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. President. Um, I'm just here, a few comments to make. Um, I promise not to go over my 20 minutes allocated. The, um, uh, and first, I want to apologize to the, uh, to, the, to the council members and to the county executive. When I first read in the newspaper that we were getting cut $17 million uh, cold turkey, I talked about reneging on a deal. Um, I, I truly understand the issues we face around budget cuts, around the hardships we have in our budgets, um, and certainly working with our mayor, some of the decisions that we have to make and I understand that um, over the past few years that these funds were not out of a bond, but they were out of uh, what our, our former Chief Silliman used to say, reaching in the seat cushions and trying to find money to help fund a dire need. So that dire need has been funded for $33 million already. So we, we truly appreciate that. But I also understand trying to figure out um, how many distressed properties we have is like trying to figure out the starting quarterback for the Browns. It's very elusive, it's very hard, and when we think we lock in on the right franchise number, it changes. Um, and that number has been elusive. We have been seeing the evaluation of these numbers, and they have been going up. So we're trying to figure out what the need is. You've heard quite well from others about how, what, the real, what the real number is. Um, but the other part of this is um, what we've been doing with hardest hit funds and looking at our uh, border revision sales. And I truly appreciate the dedication that's been made of resources to ratchet up our prosecutions, because I know Colleen is busy over there. Uh, moving these properties through the process, but we know that the HHF funds can only be used for properties that we're in ownership on, which made these county funds that much more valuable uh, as a resource. And I can't help but look, but I remember Jack Schron uh, uh, dictating to me, the money has to be strategic. It has to meet, have an impact. Um, and so when we have a resource that we know is timed over a certain period of time, um, we know we can be strategic. We know when that money's coming in, we can rely on it to be Go to, we can rely on it to go after that strategic condemnation next to the houses that we're rehabbing, next to the new, uh, assembling land for new construction. And I know that uh, 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 Councilman Jones and I sat in that front pew for two hours at Elizabeth Baptist Church, one of the longest services that we ever sat through. Um, but we know Pastor Gibson was saying, 
What, what can we do to improve the campus around us? And that's where we use these resources strategically. Um, and, we, and I think it is incredible to have a county housing fund. I think it's incredible to look at uh, being flexible, but you can't have one without the other. Rehabbing houses next to condemned houses or investing strategically also means eliminating blighted conditions and trying to figure out um, how best we can use our resources. And I also know that of that uh, $33 million, um, a, a big portion of that went to the suburbs, and I know some suburbs have a hardship um, that we all need those resources, but it was staged specifically knowing that Cleveland would patiently wait its turn um, so as the resources become available and the next round becomes available, then Director Donald can put those in. Um, and the concern was being next in line for round six and having round six cut out without any notification um, makes it incredibly hard. So just to wrap up, um, this is very an important resource for us. I'm sure we can sit down and reasonably uh, with Ken and others figure out how we can stage this, how we can come up with a resource that we can say we're strategic in how we use it and how we recover the housing stock and recover for the families um, that are in dire need of seeing the distress go away and our housing market recovered in a very well-managed way. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. G. Mayor Earl Lichen. And I just want to apologize, no disrespect, I'm leaving for a joint meeting on marijuana at City Hall. Not a meeting about smoking joints, a, a, a meeting, a joint meeting between finance and our development planning committee about the legalization of marijuana. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the county council, the executive, Ken Surratt, others in the staff, uh, for the amount of help that you've already provided with the funding that you've given for uh, demolitions. Uh, to just cite a couple of examples from my own community, uh, we have done commercial developments, that commercial demolitions that we would never have been able to do without the help of the county. That has spurred economic development in our Van Aken area and elsewhere. Uh, that will bring not only additional dollars to our community, but additional dollars to the county. In the Moreland area, which was very hard hit by the foreclosure crisis, one in four homes were hit. Uh, it's a low mod community with an average income of $32,000 uh, per uh, household. Uh, the uh, county demolition funds have been critical to allow us to demolish uh, 34 homes. And we, uh, as a city, are now investing in the area. We've secured a uh, $50,000 grant from the National Endowment of the Arts. And we're in the process of revitalizing uh, that whole community. Again, something that could not have happened uh, without your help. Uh, having said that, um, um, I would advocate bringing a sense of balance to this process. Uh, I mean, we are cognizant of the fact uh, that the county has also been hit very hard by uh, losses of $30 million uh, in uh, Medicaid funding, $60 million over the biennium. And I know you have a significant uh, uh, other needs that are going to have to be met. Um, I hope you'll keep in mind, however, uh, continued investment in uh, demolition. Um, and um, well, uh, Shaker uh, is uh, prepared to, to stand uh, out in this round in light of the help that you've already provided to us. And I would encourage others to stand out in terms of the total needs. Uh, you have heard about funding needs in other communities. And uh, I would ask that you not neglect the uh, uh, entering suburbs, particularly, uh, you've heard from Bedford Heights, Cleveland Heights, South Euclid, Maple Heights, uh, and East Cleveland. Uh, so please consider those uh, carefully uh, in your uh, difficult decision. And finally, we are also supportive of the county housing plan, which we think can do a great deal of good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Jean. Ms. Liu. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, definitely, I'm not considered any kind of an expert because I'm, in general, representing the group people who have no way to afford of anything. 
However, from all these experts, their uh, uh, testimonials, I found out something very serious concerning this housing or the development for the whole county. The data presented to you earlier actually didn't project the needs. However, in reality, we know for sure homeless people are getting more and more. Demolition funds is important, but don't think about only the business part of the growth. Also, we need affordable housing. So in this case, even you help us to make sure we have demolition funds in all communities. Also make sure they all have a good follow-up plans to utilize the land great regain so they can really benefit everybody, not just only certain few people. Thank you very much. Okay. Ms. Jean? That was the last speaker. I would like council to make note that several of these municipalities and agencies have also submitted written testimony, which you have copies. Thank you very much. And uh, we don't have minutes from the last meeting, so hopefully at the next meeting we can have uh, that one plus this one and we can do them together. Okay. And matter referred to the committee for discussion, of course, is resolution 2017 Dash 0182, Ms. Jean, could you please read that into the record? Resolution number 2017-0182, adopting the 2018-2019 biennial operating budget and capital improvements program and declaring the necessity that this resolution become immediately effective. Thank you very much. And first to uh, speak today and, and uh, covering the area that was the, uh, the uh, subject of 55 minutes of public comment, which we're all very concerned about, is Director Carter, Department of Development. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, good afternoon. Uh, I am Ted Carter, the Chief Economic Development and Business Officer. I'm pleased to present the Department of Development's 2018-2019 budget request. As you know, the Department of Development was designated as the lead county governmental function in the 2011 Charter to facilitate job creation and community vitality. Our vision and mission is to serve as an economic and community development center of excellence and innovation to our 59 communities. This budget request is structured to accelerate our ability to deliver value to our communities. This budget request was carefully developed in consultation with OBM and is predicated primarily on using the recent unanticipated revenue resulting from the repayment of $4.5 million in loan proceeds from Jumpstart. This repayment was made to the department this past September. A core element of our mission is to make prudent loans that result in return principal and earnings. The Jumpstart repayment is an illustration of this and was a collaborative partnership with ED, Council ED committee members, the law department, the executive, and my team to structure. In making this budget request, we were acutely aware of the overall budget environment that the county faces. We requested only what we considered to be core essential needs so that the balance of the unanticipated windfall from Jumpstart could be used for broader general fund needs. I believe that this request balances addressing critical needs to correct departmental operation deficiencies that have been identified by the Inspector General, Ernst & Young, and our Economic Development Improvement Team, as well as my own assessment. These modest investments will allow for the department to be more proactive going forward with respect to engagement of our clients, ensuring financial integrity in the management of our complex $72 million loan portfolio, and providing confidence in our loan portfolio management while also contributing to the overall good of the county by supporting our sister agencies. Specifically, our budget request includes funding for business services through partnerships. Second page here. $100,000, $50,000 to the Greater Cleveland Partnership for the development of a minority business collaborative, which will direct businesses to training and corporate procurement opportunities. Now, the second $50,000 is to the Ohio Aerospace. Uh, Innovation Center for a biz tech transfer and com commercialization pilot with NASA. In October of this year, EDA was awarded a grant to this initiative based on our preliminary commitment. 
Our budget calls for five new positions. Four or five of these positions were addressed in the Ernst & Young report to build out functions to improve the financial integrity and compliance of our $53 million in outstanding loans, uh, which will lead to enhanced transparency and maximize loan collections while improving departmental operations and client services. The fifth position is to support the creation of the business ombudsman, long championed by the executive. Lastly, as been, has been mentioned, out of our, general, of, out of our economic development revolving loan fund, uh, we intend to reallocate and redeploy $3 million over two years to support the creation of the county housing fund, which is a core recommendation of the county's housing plan. Lastly, $250,000 has been uh, submitted to support the onboarding of a third-party loan servicer. This was also a recommendation of the Ernst & Young report, as well as the Inspector General. I anticipate doing some modest departmental restructuring and realignment for continued prudent cost management during this budget cycle. Uh, some key successes this year, which are a continuation of our 2016 um, and 2017 uh, momentum, uh, continue continuing to attract key companies like Sterogenics, ABB, and Seven Signal, while supporting place-based and traditional real estate projects like Link 59 and the Beacon. Uh, to the business ombudsman will continue to support proactive business engagement. Uh, we have created this year the new workforce development innovation vertical. Uh, most importantly, um, we have finalized with our partners the creation of a housing plan with our housing coalition partners. One of the key elements in this request is to delay uh, some of the funding for the contribution to the demo fund. While this request is based primarily to solve budget needs, the practical reality that it also aligns with the timing of demo spending and its process. Our request again also commits $3 million over two years, as I've stated, from our economic development housing, I'm sorry, from our economic development revolving loan fund to, to support the creation of a housing fund uh, which will be focused on housing rehab. Uh, Mr. Surratt can speak more directly to the analysis that has been done in terms of the results of the demolition program and its magnitude. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, Director, uh, could you send the clerk a copy of your testimony? Sure. So that we can circulate it around to all members. Be happy to do that. And Ms. Simon is first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To the director, just for clarification, I want to understand the $3 million funding for a housing fund, is, and you said that's going to come from revolving loan proceeds? Repayment. Yes, That's what so the suggestion isn't to, to divert money from the, the demo fund balance. It's from another source. Correct. And so is reviewing this that, excuse me, uh, um, Council One, uh, in reviewing this budget with uh, the Office of Budget OBM, we discovered that that is a reallocation from our revolving loan fund and is a contribution to that housing to capitalize the uh, housing fund, which we're very supportive of. As one of the speakers said, economic development and community development and housing are, are one of the two of the same coin. So the fund, our repayments go into the Economic Development Revolving Loan Fund, and so the Budget Office, uh, with our concurrence, made a uh, recommendation that some of that money be used to capitalize the housing fund. So do you anticipate an increase in the, the, the loan repayment fund because we're stepping up collection on that? We do, increase, Kate, we do anticipate a modest increase in... Uh, Collections, yes. So, so how had that funding been used before? Um, now that it's being reallocated from from your proposal to to a housing fund, well, I what would, are we uh, what are we diverting to from? Let someone from OBM answer that specifically. Uh, 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 but the intention is to re as this uh, body has uh, as uh, talked about is using this fund to re lend to uh, businesses. But in this instance, we anticipate a modest increase in collections and uh, in order to make the budget work, a decision was made to use some of that money to capitalize the housing fund. Was there a discussion about using this modest increase to restore the money to the demo fund? Uh, not with me personally, uh, but I defer to uh, the budget office too. So do you, what, in your opinion, how is this money best used as the director? Well, the, uh, well, two ways. One is, like I said, I'm supportive of this, the way this has been structured, because 
economic development and housing community development are complementary. Uh, because of the budget challenges we face, I'm comfortable with this money being diverted uh, for the housing fund use, given some of the needs that are, have been identified for that. So do you have an opinion whether the money's better used for a housing fund versus demo fund, considering the, the state of our um, structures that need demo now? Yeah, I think it's not, a, I think it's a complimentary. So, you know, uh, Mr. Surratt uses this um, term where we've ad addressed a crisis and now we're into a maintenance mode. And so there are communities that need the rehab money. I know that's been the source of a debate both within the housing partnership coalition that has uh, worked on the, on the plan, but I think this allows us an opportunity to use a small amount of money for housing rehab. Okay, so, so you believe that we're no longer in crisis mode? Well, what I would say is that there was a crisis that was addressed, and now there's, well, there's work that remains to be done. There's a balance in how we address the, the remaining blighted conditions in East Cleveland and Cleveland and other uh, parts of the county. Okay, those are my questions for now, Mr. Chair. I know we have a lot probably lined up. Okay, other questions either for the director or for any of our presenters earlier? Uh, Ms. Brown, did you? End it? No. Then we have Vice President Jones and Councilman Tron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Director Carter, as you just mentioned, um, in terms of the crisis level, um, I'm glad to see Mr. Frank Ford here because he, he goes back to the, he was here and, and presented to us from the very beginning when we created the demolition fund, when this council initiated, uh, again, the demolition fund. And, and I'll go back. There was, there was some debate around what the true number was, but there was a number of $250 million thrown out at one time. And I'm sure there are some who might debate that number, but it was an initial number of what the need was in terms of demolition. Okay. When we introduced $50 million, we knew we were only putting a, a, a drop in the bucket um, uh, doing an amount that was larger than any other county in this country has ever put towards demolition. So we were doing something special, but we didn't think it was going to solve the entire problem. But we did believe it would be by putting our money where our mouth was, we, had, we laid the foundation to attract additional dollars, which did happen, thanks to many in this room, $70 million of hardest hit funds. But again, 50 and 70, 120 million, which doesn't touch the number that Again, an arguable number, but doesn't touch what, uh, what was uh, put out there from the very beginning. So um, I, I will push back against any thought that what we've done has solved the problem or, or the problem doesn't exist. Um, will we have conversation around what these additional dollars are? Yes, we'll have that conversation. Um, but to think that we have, for council to think that we have solved the problem, um, that narrative I don't think it should be out there in the atmosphere. So I don't necessarily have a question, um, but I just need to put that out there. So, okay, okay. Councilman Tran. Yes, uh, because the director stated two times, and I really have to take offense to it, that this is an unanticipated windfall that that uh, JumpStart showed up with this uh, with their their funds. I know that we sat here in the Economic Development Committee and Mr. Leach took, the, took that podium up there and said that no, that they did anticipate that they were going to have an event, which is in code speak for their uh, having a sale of a major asset within Jumpstart and that yes, we did anticipate that. So when that four and a half million dollars was asked, would we take that as a repayment and accelerate the loan? We hadn't even built that into the document None of the people you listed had built that in the document and say that now it's an unanticipated windfall that we're going to create a brand new department, a brand new function to create a new housing with new budgets and new things in the middle of where we have all this other budget crisis. I am really disappointed to hear those kind of words of unanticipated windfall and the creation of uh, a new housing uh, department when uh, this is brand new when we're in the middle of a, of a budget crisis. We're hearing push, push, push to reduce. We're hearing Mr. Bracatelli talk about strategic, and here we are creating new funding, new departments, and new uh, new ways of going about spending money. When we have, when we sat here and said, "Let's put fifty million dollars into," we know it was not going to be enough money. And we're killing one program at the expense of starting a new one. 
So I just, I am bothered when you, we say that this is unanticipated uh, funds because a lot of us anticipate that those monies were gonna come here, they would be staying in economic development, they'd be doing job creation, they'd be supporting you in this in this manner. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, through the chair to Mr. Strong, let me just uh, back up for a second. I don't think that I, I said the housing fund is a new, it's a new department. There's a specific fund that would be allocated uh, for a different elements of uh, housing rehab. Um, in terms of unanticipated, I might just distinguish between the, the intent was always there for sure, as you and I have talked about. But in terms of the timing of it, Mr. Leach did we did structure this with the intent that any windfall or or capital event on the payout of one of their uh, invested companies uh, would come back to this department, and so. Um, the budget department can talk more precisely about how the money has been allocated. What we've done in the presentation of our budget is take that infusion of capital and the new requests that we're making, use it to fund. So it's really investing in ourselves. And so we've taken a portion of that 4.5 for the new requests that we've made. And then the balance we've said to the budget office, please, this is our contribution to the greater uh, deficit that the county's facing. I guess I look at economic development as being a different department than when you look at our charter, it, it has in the preamble, three of the top items within the preamble mm -hmm. says job and job creation, economic development. And here we've got <clears throat> just as a total budget, you have such a small subset of what goes in uh, into the economic development and job creation. And here we are taking away what could have been a tool to actually create more jobs, put more revenue in in line and, uh, and and I don't see, unless I'm missing something, how we're gonna be creating the jobs that this could have been, like Ms. Simon said, reoccurring that revenue out there. It just seems to me this is, would be, if I was in your shoes, I'd be arguing, don't take that money. Uh, let me have it as one of my vehicles to try and create and be a job creator, which is what our charter says that no this whole department was, was functioned to be. Well, we're in extraordinary circumstances and so, uh, I put forward what I thought was a credible request to the executive, which I support. And, you know, we're part of the county. So our mission is important. You've heard from many. So the, the balance of the unused funds, which of that 4.5 million specifically, we said to the budget office, this is our contribution to help you offset cuts. Um, you know, how they accounted for specifically our existing revolving loan fund to, to fund the housing fund versus others. Um, but I don't think the two, but I, I hear what you're saying, Mr. Uh, Mr. Do, you, do you have any jobs associated with this? With the housing fund? I'm sure there will there'll be contractors, small business contractors that would do some of these repairs, yes. Okay. So. But Mr. Sorak can talk to how the housing fund, which is still being developed, and so you heard Mr. McDermott talk about it as a concept, um, how that might be applied. But there will obviously be job creation. And, and I won't ask you any questions in regards to the loan program because we've got another committee meeting that's going to take after, mm -hmm. after this, so we'll pick it up at that sure. point. Ms. Simon. Just a follow up question on this ombudsman position. Mm -hmm. what, what's the, um, the the description for this position and, and what's the associated salary? Uh, the intent of the ombudsman is to be the point person uh, working with Team Neo and GMCP in my office to call businesses in the county proactively. So the uh, proactively reach out to businesses in the county and, and do a check in. Uh, to also identify needs that the county might be able to resolve and to do the follow-up associated with that. And so we, these three entities have talked about a county-wide call plan uh, to accomplish that. So that person will be the point person. That's the singular responsibility is outreach to businesses. Some of those may result in loan activity. Others may be other things that uh, we need to be, that need to be resolved, that we could resolve on the business behalf. So um, just give you an example. So, so there's a, a company here in the, a county that we met with who um, had some issues uh, at the uh, Global Healthcare Innovation Center regarding their tenancy. Uh, so they articulated those. They also identified um, reasons why they weren't maximizing the convention center. And so that person we would turn to and say, please follow up with the convention center, uh, the Global Health Center, Innovation Center, and resolve those issues. Uh, I think the salary is um, somewhere in the $90,000 range. Are you looking as well to get a deputy director in your department? Well, that will be replaced with that position is vacant at the moment. And okay. that person will be focused on operations, day-to-day -day operations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Councilman Tuma, followed by Con Wallen Baker. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to hitchhike off with uh, Councilwoman Simon and, and Councilman uh, Jones, we're talking about with respect to the demolition program. So, just to clarify, did did you state that it, it's your opinion that the the crisis with respect to to blight is is over or taken no, care of? I didn't of? say that. What I said was that this program, just uh, as you've seen from, has had some success. And so there's been some success around mitigating uh, uh, the blight problem. And now uh, we're at a pace where we can methodically uh, address the blight that remains. So I would never say that it's been eliminated. I don't think I said that on the record. Okay, I, I, that, I, that's why I'm asking. Um, so, so why not stick to the program that's in place and, and do more to try to eliminate the, the blight that is out there for, for Cleveland and the suburbs and, and, and rather than moving on with respect to rehab? I mean, why not focus on the problem that's out there that's still out there? <clears throat> I think what we've uh, articulated here uh, allows us to address I mean, the amount that we put forward in this budget for rehab for this housing fund is a very modest amount, so it's nowhere near what was budgeted for the blight, to address blight, and uh, is to really provide uh, some, um, some specific investment in one of the elements that the housing uh, coalition and the housing plan recommended that the housing fund be fully, not be fully, be funded, and that's we wanted to make a good faith down payment on an element of that plan. And, you know, there's been this debate, rehab versus, um, and I, my personal belief is that we should try to do both. Um, but this is a very modest investment in that component of the plan. It, and so you're of the opinion that now is the time to do that as far as, far as moving forward with a rehab versus sticking just with, the, with removing blight? Well, I'm accepting the recommendation of people who are far more uh, steeped in this space than I am. Uh, the housing uh, partners who helped uh, work with uh, our housing leader to create this housing plan, and that was their recommendation now. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's fine. Thank you. Well, that was one of their recommendations, and so we uh, have used this modest amount of money to support that. I, I would just, I mean, if you're... Being, again, I don't want to put you on the spot, but as a, as a director, you certainly would have an opinion if you disagreed with that. I, you would let that be known to whomever I'm imagining. Of course. Correct. Yeah, okay. But I've said that I support the construct of the budget and the use of this money out of the Economic Development Revolving Loan Fund uh, to achieve that objective. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Conwell. Thank you. Um, through the chair to director, um, can you clarify on the position to be filled? You. Uh, you were answering Councilwoman Simon's question. Um, the outreach communication with businesses, you had just stated you were looking for a point person and that salary would be roughly 90000 right, That's the business ombudsman. Business. Okay, but their primary focus, I know the title's different, it doesn't have communication in it, but their, their main focus is to be with communication, right? to be able to communicate back and forth in, internally and with the, the businesses, correct? Correct. Okay. So, so outreach to the businesses. So every business in this community in conjunction with Team NEO and GCP. Okay. And so we already have, uh, uh, administration already has two communications departments, one for HHS internally, and uh, administration has external communications. Why couldn't this be run through their department already? Why are we creating something new? Well, it's not a uh, communications primary function. It's not a communications function. Well, that's what I had. So, yeah, okay. it's an outreach function, an engagement function with the business community. So uh, is that going to be their only function? Because communication is going to play a role. I'm sure that communications will. And, and when that occurs, we will work with the executive's communication uh, office as well as any relevant department. So I could imagine if, if public works, there might be something there that makes sense. Um, you know, a lot of these businesses oftentimes will uh, uh, request infrastructure support from, from the county. So I can envision where that would be a, a time where communications uh, may be involved. But it's not, uh, communications is really a subset 
of what they'd be doing. It's, it's really business engagement, proactive business engagement. And right now, uh, we are not doing that uh, nearly at the level I'd like to. So when you talk about proactive business engagement, what do you foresee in your mind? How do you, how do you role play what that position will be like, that, that individual to do? Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> working, again, with these our two external partners, Team NEO and the Greater Cleveland Partnership, we would create, and there has been created, a list of businesses in the county, small, medium, large. So this person would methodically work with those two entities to identify and create a call plan for outreach to the business community. Uh, and doing those calls, uh, whether it's our assigned businesses, uh, we would you know, ask them about uh, their level of satisfaction with county services. We sync with and coordinate with the municipalities that these businesses are in, and then identify any issues that um, the business is experiencing. And there may be none, and there may be some where we can facilitate resolution of an issue uh, with our municipal partner. Uh, but it's really proactive engagement and something that the executive has really said, look, we want to be proactive and not reactive. Right now, for the most part, we are reacting to the marketplace. We're not engaging in uh, activity in, in a sophisticated, structured way. I, I get that. You said Team Neo, and who was the other partner? Greater Cleveland Partnership. Okay. And so usually who's going to – if we create this um, ombudsman's department – and we have this person that's going to be um, proactive with businesses, but we're also partnering with two, uh, NEO, Team NEO and GCP. Who's going to be responsible responsible for the oversight? I mean, we create these things all the time, but then no, no one actually has oversight from the county. So will this person have oversight over those two organizations, making sure that these things are being done? Well, the person will report to me, so ultimately the oversight will be my responsibility. This person will work with those two entities, and in terms of follow-up, that um, it, it is part of the county's responsibility. That person will have responsibility for identifying issues. So let's say they have a tax issue, right, that, that uh, has been identified in the conversation. This person would interact with the treasurer's office in the physical office to resolve, help resolve that issue. <clears throat> As, as one example. Okay. So. So it's not a department, it's a position. I, I, I get that. A position within the Department of Development. But it's another layer created. So I'm just trying to think if you have those two entities and that person is overseeing that they're going to do what the county um, is looking at to do, but then they're not really responsible for the oversight you are. I think that person or in that position is also responsible because they're the ones meeting with Team NEO and GCP on a regular mm -hmm. basis. Mm -hmm. You know, so they are responsible. That should be one of their, uh, um, part, in part of their classification because they have to report back to you. You're not going to all those meetings. That's correct. To, to, to make sure that's the problem with some areas of the county is that we don't have enough oversight you know, we create these positions, but there's, there's no oversight to come back and to be able to communicate fully with council and the administration and what's going on. Thank you. Ms. Baker. Okay. Um, thank you, Director, for, for being here today and giving us some insight. Upon your hiring, was there anyone below you that had the role of doing what it is that you're explaining now you need in your department? Are you the one and only person that is in your department that actually reaches out to GCP and Team NEO? No. Okay, so why, what, if I just may kind of follow that, mm -hmm. why is the structure that's in place now that you are now the department head, and I'm not sure how many people answer to you in that role of reaching out to these other um, organizations, why is it that uh, that's not enough? Um, I'd like to have someone who is totally focused on outreach. Uh, we do have professionals who part of their job description uh, is uh, the outreach to the marketplace. Uh, but this person would really do nothing but that and then work with those folks, uh, our loan officers, in terms of structuring loans and things like that. Um, if I may, who will, what? then those that are in your department now that answer to you regarding their outreach, 
with this person now taking their place, what will the other, what will these other in, employees or people that answer to you do now? Are they going to change their uh, job description? Well, they'll do a, uh, they'll do some outreach and they'll do loan uh, loan structuring and underwriting. Uh, right now, uh, you have to kind of look historically where we have had, like a lot of departments, you know, a, a decrease in staffing. And so we've become not as proactive as I think we need to be. So um, when the executive, and I think when he first arrives, heard kind of this feedback from the business community about having an ombudsman that can both do engagement and then resolution of issues. Uh, since I've arrived, what those two business entities have said is, and they've said it consistently over the uh, 20 months I've been here, you know, what's the status of the call plan? And so the collective call plan. And so we have not gotten to that for a number of reasons. And so the thought here was to honor the executive's vision, but also have a single point person uh, that will do nothing but. Now, I do it on, on a, on a, on a, on a uh, uh, inconsistent basis, uh, but it's not systemic. It's not, that's not what I do day in and day out. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, you know, more episodic. Um, and the times that I have done it, we haven't, the handoff between business follow-up has not been as satisfactory as I would like. Uh, so single point of focus, that's all this person does, working with the existing professionals that we have. And so we'll structure that, and, and we, then we should have some great results. If I may. Um, Please continue. So I know that you've been really unexpectedly, I think, in your term, um, preoccupied with the loan and the protocol mm -hmm. and all that that has taken yeah. a lot of your time in trying to rein that in and understand it and give reporting back and be accountable for those dollars. Mm -hmm. But I would think that there'd be a point where you've got it, it's manageable, you have the procedures in place, and your time would be freer. Is that a vision that you share, <laughs> that you, uh, you will be able to get out there perhaps more than you are now and what you hoped you would have been when first hired? Do you think that when that happens, that this person you're talking about that looks like they're going to be doing much of that uh, will be needed as, as, uh, as much as perhaps today your vision is? And the people that are kind of on the second tier, perhaps they could be more engaged too as we get our hands around some of the tasks that you've been given that was unexpected perhaps when you first began. Uh, I can't argue, argue with your logic, uh, uh, Ms. Baker. What I would say is that even if we, I think the, a, a singular role is important given the number of businesses that we have here and the uh, level of engagement and uh, uh, connectivity we'd like to have with the business community. Uh, so I would still engage, I would still foresee a person uh, doing this with me for sure. You would? Yes. Mm -hmm. One final question. Um, earlier in this year, uh, we were given the skill up people that um, the executive proposed and very excited about being that reach out to businesses. And I believe there were six that were, were hired. Is there any overlap there? I understand that's about workforce training, and but still, they're out there, they're investigating, they're talking to businesses. That is primarily their role. How does that interact with you and this person that will be your point person and the rest of your department. Seems like a lot of people are involved in this outreach, whether it's workforce, skill up, general outreach, encouraging businesses, whatever. I would think that there'd be a lot of overlap there. Yeah, well, it's a big county. Um, what I would say is that uh, the skill up professionals, outreach is a component of their job description, so they do that. That's one phase, and then they have other more tactical phases in terms of doing these workflow and uh, occupational and, and, and skill assessment analysis. And um, so on the first phase, they would coordinate with the ombuds person, particularly if there was something that was in the um, course of conversation around workforce that some other dimension of the business environment that was outside of their realm would go to that business ombudsman. But we Mid-year, we talked about this uh, customer relationship management system, which we're going to put in so that uh, we have a system where every business that we contact, you know, we have a profile on the company and what the issue is, resolution or follow-up that needs to be required. Uh, and so some instances, um, 
that business ombudsman person uh, will be responsible. Well, I would say in most instances, the skill up is very specific, mm -hmm. right? And so if a um, um, if the skill up folks are really supposed to be focused on workforce, but then the court's conversation, some other things may very well come up. Right. All right. Thank you. Okay. I'm. Uh, I'm looking at the clock and, and knowing that we have another uh, committee meeting at 3 o'clock. So it's, it's clear that the, uh, the best we could possibly do is to finish this department and one more, which is the County Planning Commission. So I'm going to have to apologize to uh, Director Dever, uh, uh, Ms. Ripka, and, and Mr. Daly for uh, Department of Public Works and Soil and Water and so Soldiers and Sailors, and, and we're going to have to ask you to come back uh, uh, a week from today at 1 o'clock, and, uh, and I apologize for that. And uh, so we're going to get through at least this one and see if we can do one more, and we have Ms. Simon followed by Harrison Jones and Conwell. I defer to my colleague, Hairston. Thank you, um, Councilwoman Simon. Mr. Miller, uh, to the director, uh, some of the questions have already been asked about the business ombudsman. When you talked about the, the vacant deputy director position, is, that some, is, it, is it not, or maybe I'm confused about what the deputy director will be doing, maybe is that some, some of the things that you've outlined with the, the new $95,000 position that the deputy director can be tasked with? and the other subordinates who are all within the department be able to handle some of the, the handoff uh, with some of the requests that the business community has made. Uh, if I understand your question, Councilman Harrison, you're asking if the deputy director can assume part of that role. Certainly they can do part of it, yes. But again, this is a single person full time doing nothing but engagement with the thousands of businesses we have here in this county and then coordinating that with those two entities. Sure, I understand that, but but you have Mr. Surratt who engages with the the uh, CD community. You have Mrs. Parks who who engage with her her community in the in the in the in the world that she deals with within ED and CD. You have other uh, employees who deal with the folks who uh, are in their world, and to have this individual, maybe the deputy director, to be that intake person or, or the initial concerns come to them and then it's handed off to one of the individuals who are within the department. Don't get me wrong. I understand that the uh, current staff are, are I'm sure, are, are overworked already. But seeing it and looking at this budget and, and we're cutting things this way and cutting things that way, that it will make more sense for us to maybe look at that option uh, rather than <clears throat> funding a, a new position within the department. You know your department more, uh, much more than I do, much more well than I do. But just a thought, as I'm hearing some of the things that uh, you stated that the uh, ombudsman will be doing. Now, the sixty thousand dollar brownfield analyst would that be an additional person, or would that be uh, filling the vacancy that's there? I know we had one person who was handling those brownfield intake uh, applications. Right. That is a uh, that's not filling a vacancy. That is a new uh, position, and so intentionally, what we've done here is. You know, this committee, or certainly the uh, Economic Development Committee knows it was a backlog at one point this year on the brownfields, and so uh, that is additional capacity to, so we've got a, that backlog has uh, reappeared. It's not as, as acute as it was. It, it's to help make sure that we are keeping that backlog to a minimum and being more proactive in working with our communities in terms of identifying uh, other uh, brownfields opportunity uh, and also working with another department so the sustainability analyst periodically we've gotten uh, requests from the office of sustainability uh, to look at uh, deals that have a sustainability or environmental component so they would if we can find the right person would also have the expertise to support uh, that office as well so it's really looking at how to best leverage and, and uh, support two offices but brownfields and brownfield sustainability overlap as you know um, uh, but this is a new position. Uh, so historically, there were four, three or four people doing uh, sustainability work in the county. Uh, that is eroded to one. Uh, that person is, uh, without question, uh, oh, tapped out in terms of uh, capacity. She does a great job, but uh, this would be a welcome addition in terms of facilitating Brownfield's applications that we get. And I appreciate the response. No doubt that we need to add uh, an additional uh, set of hands to that uh, department so we can uh, quickly 
move through those uh, requests for brownfield help. Uh, and, and Mr. Chair, if, if I could, just quickly, the contract for loan service within the department, uh, is that different from the, the uh, would that, that be in the same division the, to the, with the assistant to the loan portfolio manager? Is that one of the same? Is that is, are those two individuals within that loan servicing department, or is that sorry, in which, addition to uh, the contract for loan servicing? Separate. So the contract for loan servicing, that money is uh, envisioned to be for third-party outsourcing. The loan portfolio manager will oversee that service, and then there will be this assistant who will be more of an administrative type that will uh, manage our record keeping. So one of the deficiencies that uh, have been identified is our record keeping and filing have just been, so that person is responsible for record managing and assisting the loan portfolio manager with administrative and clerical. Uh, so the loan portfolio manager and his assistant will oversee the contract uh, that will be set or go out uh, for loan servicing within the department? In part, so there's a part of our loan servicing that will be retained within the county so the origination and underwriting of the loans, okay. the creation of the uh, uh, loan files and things like that, and then uh, part of that person's responsibility will be the um, oversight of the contract. Okay. The contract I, door. I would encourage everyone interested in this topic to stay for the 3 o'clock meeting where that's going to be discussed in a lot greater detail. Sure, and that's what I wanted to quote my question in yeah. there because I know we're, 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 we're having, I'll be there. Okay. And so we're having a uh, meeting. But uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to say that just looking and reflecting on my comments uh, and concerns that were raised when this budget was first introduced about the $3 million creation of the, the uh, the neighborhood fund, the housing fund, uh, and withdrawing the $17 million commitment that this council had set forward to continue the demolition of vacant abandoned properties. It has not been more clear today that we must continue that uh, effort and we must continue on that promise that we have made to many of the communities around Cuyahoga County. I'm certain that we in this county, this council did not step up to the plate, as Mr. Jones has said, and do for the communities that no other county has done within Ohio and frankly within our region and, and, and it may be all across the U.S. The work that we have seen and we have heard and the testimonies on behalf of the communities, we don't want to see that undone. We don't want to see that all unravel. We know that the properties that still are standing and exist in our community that lie in our streets pose serious threats to the citizens' safety and, and health and well-being on a daily basis. We still see a steady decline in property values. Our homeowners, I'm sure you all get calls just as I do, of the steady decline in their property valuation. And I don't think it was the intent of this council that set forth the $50 million demolition fund in an effort to uh, claw that back once additional funding had been come down to pipeline. So, so again, Mr. Chairman, I, I am in support of, of, of restoring the full $17 million to the demolition program that this council has made and has committed to these communities. Thank you. Vice President Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Carter, we, we heard during the presentations, the public comments, uh, the statement that 60% uh, of the monies had gone to suburbs, 40% to Cleveland, um, can you confirm that? Is that an accurate? Is, is this the ratio of how the monies have? Yeah, I'd have to defer to Mrs. Surratt, who would have those numbers and how that money has been spent. Good afternoon, Ken Surratt, Department of Development. Um, the 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 question of the the allocation of the resources, what Mr. Ford was looking at. Um, when he talks about the, the need, he's talking countywide. So he's talking every single potential demo there is. However, uh, where I would disagree with Mr. Ford, um, and I've, I've told him so, um, is where he's lo only looking at one pot of money. So if you're looking at countywide demolition need, you should be looking at countywide demolition dollars as well. Um, and if you take into consideration hardest hit funds, 90% of those dollars are going to go to Cleveland. Um, or at least that's what in the last report that I saw we were reimbursed for 
90% of those properties were in the city of Cleveland. Uh, and then Cleveland just recently, um, you know, in the last half of the year, announced $5 million first, and now I just two weeks ago, another $8 million for demolition. So I think all those monies have to be considered um, as well when you're looking at the, the balance of, of addressing the need. Um, so it's more, um, my estimation, it's probably more like 70-30. So I don't think we're as far off as Mr. Ford stated. Okay. And, and we're here to serve the entire county. Um, I am elected by the Cleveland and, and suburban communities. And we created this to find the right balance, the right balance. And uh, let me ask this question. When we first created the demolition fund, there was a, a, a policy where each round would be for $1 million. Any city that captured the $1 million would move into the next round. Any city that did not reach the $1 million would not go into the second round. Is that an accurate characterization of how the policy was initially written? Um, to the councilman, to the chair, um, it's it's not exactly correct. So the legislation is it, what it says in your first application. There's a maximum award of a million dollars. Um, every subsequent round after that could be up to two million dollars. Um, and the way to get a, a subsequent award, you must be with at least eighty percent of the proceed orders. I Meaning you've taken all the legal steps necessary um, to demolish a house. It doesn't have to be down. You, you've you've gotten the proceed orders. Um, in order to then apply again. So you need to get 80% of whatever you applied for in the previous round. Okay. Um, we probably need to have more conversation later, but I, I'd like to hear more about the, uh, the balance uh, uh, of how, and, and if we're reaching our goals, one of bringing down, uh, trying to reduce the, the drop in property values. The original strategy was meant to accomplish that. So um, one of my next question would be, uh, are we succeeding in that um, one effort? Uh, and do we know, is it too early to make that determination as of yet? But are we impacting the, uh, the drop in property values with our demolition efforts? Um, that, that's to the councilman. Uh, that's a great question. Um, as I think you all are aware, in 2018, um, actually, I think the process already started um, for our uh, latest appraisal. And this is where we actually go door to door. Um, our our, our um, appraisal group and out of the fiscal office. So uh, I think you'll have some really good information um, and, and actually see that. I think looking at just kind of um, sales, um, I think there's many markets that are strong. You've seen sales go up. I think that's a component of the actual appraisal itself um, is the uh, kind of arm's length sales. So I think that that is a good indicator in many communities. And I'm not going to say all. They're definitely still um, recovering communities. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think you'll see some of that um, bear to light. One of the things we learned in that um, the, the study, I think it was referred to earlier about um, the impact of demolition on property values, um, is that, uh, that the, um, the impact is not as great um, in the weaker markets. The impact is actually stronger as you are in stronger markets. Um, and there's actually another study that says pretty much the same thing about rehab. Um, and so I think that's why you hear some of the balance of, of uh, you know, we need uh, multiple tools um, in, in our tool um, toolbox and not just um, demolition. Um, uh, that said, I don't know if I, I can address maybe, um, I know we're, we're short time, but some of the, the comments about demolition and, and, the, and the funding and maybe actually just leave you all with a, a, a question. Um, I, you know, Mr. Ford and I, we've talked about um, the, the need issue um, quite a bit over the last week. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to question um, his numbers um, where it looks like a need of, uh, with the committed funds, through hardest hit funds, our funds, things that have been allocated, Cleveland's, um, that that could leave a hole of about 2,400 um, uh, units. Um, and, and, and what I think, um, you know, my, my 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 quote that I was I was saying um, to um, Director Carter was when we started before we started the fund we were looking at ten thousand properties. I mean that's a, that that was deemed a crisis to us. I think we're leaving we're moving into this um, uh, and with the additional funds, the hardest hit funds, the thirteen million Cleveland's put in, where now it seems a little more manageable. Um, and then I think by the time end of twenty twenty. 
that's when we, we can get to a, what I consider maintenance. Um, so many of the first suburbs wrote to me and said, you know, we might need five to 10 to 20, um, you know, demos a year for the next couple of years. To me, that's maintenance. I mean, we're looking at a, a small fraction of each one of these communities housing stock. Even 2,400 in the city of Cleveland is probably 1% or less than 2% of, of their housing stock. So, um, you know, I, and again, I don't want to minimize the, 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 the problem because if someone's living next, if I'm living next door to a blighted vacant house, I want it down. I get it. Um, but the one thing that um, I feel I've learned the most through this whole process is it's not just the dollars. And that might sound funny, and I know I'm getting some, some looks on it, and I've, I've said this to other people, it's not just the dollars. We've had $42 million budgeted over the last two years. We've only awarded $32.5 million, meaning we haven't had the other eight. Part, you know, so in, in my idea, my thought is, well, you know, if we had the money available, it should have all been, there should be zero dollars left at this point. There really should be zero dollars left, but they're not. The D dictates that, that, that we need the money, I get that, but the problem is in the spending of the money. So in order to tear down a house, well, two things have happened. One, we've had an influx of $50 million that we weren't expecting, um, so there's other money that came to the pipeline. Um, but the other part is um, an understanding of the, the process. Just because a, a property is identified as a blighted house doesn't mean that it can be torn down the next day if you have the money. There's legal processes that need to take place. If it's tax foreclosure, you know, there's that process. If it's a nuisance abatement um, process, it's that process. This isn't always a quick process everywhere. And in those nuisance abatement processes, um, we've seen um, where, you know, to the good end where People will pull permits and fix up their house once they get notified and so they could come off the list. Um, to people pulling permits and then not fixing up their house and then appealing again. Um, there's kind of, um, you know, inspection. They don't want people to come in. You have to get a warrant to get inside their house. So you can imagine all the legal steps that are necessary to take down a house. Um, you know, in, in Cleveland, you know, uh, I think feels that uh, the round structure has, has handcuffed them. But I would just say, well, they just got another $13 million. I, 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 and, and, you know, five of it was announced five months ago. So how quickly are they spending the money that they have themselves, that they don't have to go through us? You know, so I, I, I just want to, I think that there are, um, I understand the concerns. I don't, I don't disagree with the need. What, I'm, what, what we're proposing is actually a delay in the funding, which I, which I support because I think it gives us the time to make sure we get through the legal processes, build that pipeline in every community that needs it so that when we have the dollars available, it can actually be spent. Well, and Mr. Chairman, if I might continue my question. Okay, uh, before you do, uh, it, it's clear that we're not going to get any beyond Department of Development today, so I have to apologize also to Glenn Coyne from the Planning Commission and say that we're going to have to ask you to come back next Monday. Uh, Vice President. And, and Mr. Surratt, you, you implied that the $9 million that we have allocated to this point uh, for, for the, uh, that has not been used as of yet, uh, you, what I heard was that you think there might not be as much need if the money is still sitting there. Is that what you're trying to, what you're trying to convey? I'm saying that I think the fact that there's money remaining makes me um, not question the need, but question um, the ability to spend the money immediately, okay. which is why okay. we're asking for a delay in this funding. I would not consider a delay when the need, if the money is there, there are other factors. The, 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 the paperwork around getting the, the, the ability to demolish. Cities have to reach out to, to, to owners. There, there are other factors. Um, I'm not convinced. 
I'm just, I, I'll leave it. I'm not I, I understand. I think the said. other the factor that um, other factors that mm -hmm. I, I feel play into um, this recommendation are a couple twofold. Mm -hmm. um, to reduce blight, you can do two things: you can fix it or you can tear it down. Um, uh, so I think that um, there's actually initiatives to actually start fixing. Um, the, the mayor initiated a neighborhood investment um, pro initiative. Um, you have Habitat for Humanity um, as part of the Q deal going into neighborhoods in Cleveland, um, working in communities. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, things that I think could have a, a big impact. Um, and and we, I don't know what the impact is going to be yet, but we have two Amazon fulfillment centers coming to two inner ring suburbs that are still recovering. So what's the impact of that going to be? So should we be tearing down houses out and around? Or does it actually create opportunities then for rehabilitation and investment, um, which is what I would expect to happen around those, those, those centers um, within you know, these kind of concentric circles outside of it? So I think that we also need to see how that other tool is helping play out along with the demolitions that are going to be completing. And the other, the last thing I'll say, and I'll, I'll stop talking, is um, there still are a couple sources of funding for demolition. CDBG, um, which six entitlement communities in the county receive, as well as us for 51 of the 51, 59 communities, um, is an, a re residential demo is an eligible use. Um, the other pot of money is the CDSG program that you all have created, uh, up to $50,000. Another program where demolitions and eligible use. So I think for particularly the the you know those communities where only a handful is necessary, we do have a couple different tools, um, and then those entitlement cities have that that same funding um, as well available to use for demolition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Jim. okay, we have Conwell followed by Simon Gallagher and Brown. Ms. Conwell. Thank you to the chair to, I believe this is for the director, and it's just not even a question, it's just information um, for Director Carter uh, to share with us. Uh, back to the Ombudsman Department, you stated that the county used to have the Ombudsman's Department. Uh, I know this position that you're uh, looking at is a person, just a new request for a person. So the information, if you could uh, get to us, why was the original Ombudsman Department for the county eradicated, and when, and how much did it cost us? Okay, she'll be happy. I don't think I said that there was an Ombudsman Department. I don't recall saying that. No, uh, you didn't say it, but it used to be. Oh, it used to, okay. So if you can just get, was get us that. Was it development or in another I county? don't know. It was before my time, but uh, it, it, we, had a, we had a county department. If you could just get us that information so we can weigh that uh, compared to your ask. And um, you know what year that was, uh, Councilman Conwell? It was before we got here. Uh, I think it was eradicated, I want to say, 2009, 2010, maybe. Okay. Around there. I, I will do that. And one thing that uh, I neglected to uh, cover in the ombudsman, you know, a key component of that person's uh, uh, function is to make sure that we're doing effective business retention. So much of what we do is business growth or attracting companies. Several of the deals we've done this year have been attraction deals, but the biggest growth is really in value is making sure that companies out of here don't leave. So, you know, this year we've been able to secure companies from out of market. We want to prevent that from happening to companies in Cuyahoga County by being proactively engaged with these businesses on the front end. So the ombudsman, in my mind, is really an early warning system working with these other two entities. Um, and I get that. And, and for, at one point, the county believed in it, and we supported it. But then there was a reasoning of why it was eradicated, probably due to so lack of funding somewhere else. Okay. But the request to cut, you know, in order for me to wrap my mind around around your ask for additional staff is because request to cut other positions in some departments that are already in existence and needed, uh, but then to add a new person uh, to a department. Not saying that the need isn't there, but if we already have a need over here and we're talking about cutting and eradicating them, but then give it, I, I don't work like that. So I just okay. want you to understand where my mindset yep. is. No, Thank sense. you. So two th 2009, find out what happened, what department it was in, why it was eliminated. 
and what the function was. Okay, Ms. Simon. Um, just quickly to the director, I had asked, and I think one of my colleagues asked your opinion on, on the um, reasonableness of using loan money for this $3 million housing fund. And you said that you thought it was a good idea because you relied on partners who were steeped in housing knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, and haven't you heard from the other 80% of the, the housing partners who were here and wrote letters saying how vital it is that they get the demo fund? Well, I, I did, for sure. So why is it, and maybe this is a question for Mr. Surratt, that when we, rely, when we say we're relying on partners, and, and what we do is we cut our demo fund, but yet find a new source of um, revenue to support a housing fund, How, can you explain that as a director? Do you support us restoring the housing demo fund? Well, what I support is what's been proposed in the budget and the mechanism that was used to create this housing fund. I think Mr. Surratt really effectively address the question that you have to have multiple tools in order to address okay. blighted issues. Uh, we took the recommendation of the housing coalition that co-wrote the housing plan and felt this was an element that we should lead with with a modest investment. So it can't offset all of the need from the you know, delay in the demo fund, but it is a significant okay. statement that we're making in support. So of you this agree. Plan. Okay, I heard you. You agree to, to cut the demo fund by 17 million well, and no, no, use no, three. Councilwoman. You're the director, and I'm not going to argue, but you can come. You're the one at the top, and I want to. What I'm hearing is shocking. I just have to say, from Mr. Surratt in this department, that you're going to suggest for one minute that you know cities should be relying on CDBG money or SD. That, that's just absolutely absurd. You know how that's been restricted and it's cut by the feds, and um, we're we're in a crisis, and and to find new money for for rehab when no investors are coming in right now, when you have these di properties that are in disrepair and it's blighted. So that's my comment. Okay, I, I'm Councilman, shocked and I, I'm disappointed. Okay, I heard you. You okay, agree no, no, with Ken Surratt? No, it's me, fine. With your permission, uh, just say I think what he was articulating was that. There's other sources of funding that could be used to offset some of the impact of this. In an ideal world, we wouldn't, you know, we're in a budget, so we've made judgments and. I just wanted to know what your position was, and you, you've made it clear. And the reason we're not spending the money is because there's backlogs. The land bank has backlogs because cities might not have the capacity, but they're waiting. And when you pull funding for cities like from Warrensville Heights, or you know, when they're ready to go, and you pull it because time's out, when you know there's a need, that's not okay. And I'm looking at Mr. Surratt. So I'm just. This is my. It, it's this is something that's um, shocking to me as a council person who put this together with my colleagues and and to hear back from the housing partners about what their needs are and to only re, only listen to a small segment of that housing coalition which is what the case is is shocking so I'm gonna look we, we have a meeting and mr. Gallagher needs to ask a question okay councilman Gallagher has deferred and and uh, miss Brown is next Thank you, Councilman Gallagher, and thank you, um, Councilman Miller. I, I, I guess my question kind of speaks to this issue as well. Um, Mr. Surratt, you, you spoke about, um, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't take it as the funds weren't needed. I understood it as a process and protocol issue. But when you speak to that point, um, my question is, the demolition funds that would be used to fix the properties, do you think fixing them will be done faster than dem demolishing them? To the councilwoman, that's that's a great question. I, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows that. Um, you know, I okay. I were, won't, we don't have to go because we, we're we're short on time, so the, okay. you're not clear on that. The mm -hmm. um the the other thing, and, and I don't mean to be rude. I just know that we're short on time, uh, Mr. Surratt. So I just want to get through the the questions, questions that I do have. So maybe that you can think about these as we move forward. Um, would those funds be considered? Would the people who are in line for demolition that are maybe appealing or contesting be considered for first right of the repair funds, if you will? And then the last question that I have is, I was always under the impression that the homes that would be demolished were beyond repair, that they were so badly um, blighted that they could not be fixed. So due to time, um, I will respectfully just ask you to give consideration to those things, and you, I won't expect an answer today, but um, that might be something that <laughs> we we should discuss in the future. So thank you, thank you, Councilman Miller. I'll be happy to respond to those in another time. Another time. Okay, uh, Councilman Harrison and 
Councilman Baker, and I would ask that that would be it because we don't want to impinge too far on Economic Development Committee. Uh, sure. Thank you, Mr. Miller. I, I'll, be, um, I'll be brief. First, just the director and Mrs. Surratt, don't take my comments as being ill-intended. Uh, you know, we appreciate all the great work that you all uh, have done in your, in your, in your uh, department, but, you know, as council, we have some, some deep concerns about, you know, some of the numbers we're hearing and some of the uh, proposals and things that are coming from staff, you know, just don't seem to be uh, in line with one another. So that's the first point. But just going back, and I thought about this, you know, you, uh, uh, Kenya, you and I have talked before about the issuance of a RFP regarding the fair housing uh, uh, services. In the fiscal year 17, you guys were a little bit behind getting that RFP out. Where are we on the issuance of the RFP for the fair housing services? Uh, to the councilman, that is in my pro right now. For Sarah Price Jackson, um, I'm, I, don't, I don't believe it's been issued yet, but uh, it is in, in my pro in the process to be issued shortly. And shortly is, you know, thirty days, forty-five uh, less, by the end of the year. 30. Less, less than, than thirty, 30. days. Okay. Yes, definitely. sure. And uh, one more thing, I, I put on <laughs> Sarah's plate to do, but but she know I, I love her. But nonetheless. Uh, so we should, with less than 30 days, we should look for issues RFP for fair housing services. Okay, thank you. Ms. Baker. Thank you. I'll be very brief. It's just a direct question. Um, and given this is the budget meeting we're in, it kind of, it's a little different than what's been asked. Uh, you are asking for new positions in economic development. One of them would be one that is directly under you for the approximately 90,000, I think you said. I think it would be appropriate to find out the six new positions that we, um, that I, uh, stated earlier of the upskill, it would maybe give us a little more of a comfort level to know just what the accomplishments are of those six, uh, what companies they've assisted, and um, you know what type of assistance that they've given. So if we can perhaps get something um, in writing to show the accomplishments of six that are relatively new in your department and what kind of um, success we've had, uh, may be uh, a little easier to see how you would need more. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, so that the uh, uh, director, I have some questions, but we don't have time for them, so I'll deal with them offline. Okay. And, uh, and so that the committee knows what the plan is going forward, we're going we're gonna to try to schedule the four remaining departments for uh, for the next meeting that's already scheduled, which is which is a week from today at at one o'clock, and uh, and following that meeting, then then we're going to just have a, a little discussion where uh, where any council members who wish, we would encourage everybody to. Uh, to put out three or four concerns that are the biggest in their mind so that we start to get a sense of, of uh, what the council's concerns are. And hopefully the four departments don't have conflicts that will preclude them from coming on that day. And uh, Ms. Jean, do we have anyone signed in for comment unrelated to the agenda? We do not, Mr. Chairman. There being no further business, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.